want to discuss is actually um, a poem by um, H.G. Nays, Hitler Dooley, called a mountainous poem. And it's about, uh, actually it's part from my dissertation, which I, I think is kind of relevant to uh, the conference. Uh, so, actually who was H.G.? H.G. was, uh, well, Yes, uh, why and was, and I think still is, though she's dead, uh, a modernist uh, and feminist poet, but also widely known as, um, as an imagist and a classicist. And that's really important. Her poems actually merged with an iconography of Greek and Egyptian, uh, ancient Greek and Egyptian myth. Uh, but what's also interesting is that uh, her images, uh, as an imagist poet, actually um, were constructed in such a wise uh, so that, um, uh, that they appeared to have their own reference in the physical world as well as the world of men. Now, was this important? In this uh, specific poem, Helen Meacher, the poetic and the visual collaborate uh, in such a, such a way so that the, the story of Helen and, uh, and the torture and war actually unfolds by what might bring cry in her search about all paintings in uh, England and Wales called iconographies of text. Now why is all this important to me? Because the image they encrypt information and then let's help him declare that kind of information uh, as her alter ego and through her she uh, actually witnesses, she revisits the ancient temple of Ammon and Thetis and through her own eyes, actually record and narrates Helen's story. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the story of Helen in the Trojan War visually unfolds via an image of the um, of the Temple of Karnak, actually the real uh, Ammon Temple of Karnak. Uh, as we can actually read in Lock Corridors of Lotus Spot for Moon, the Pillars, and that Lotus Florum furled with Reed of the Papyrus. I mean, the poem actually uh, opens with an image that portrays uh, the real Am Ammon Temple of Karna, which according to Stephen Wilkinson, an archaeology uh, consists of, um, of massive columns topped with carvings that have unfurled like lotus blossoms. Uh, now, this image, uh, actually uh, is accompanied by Helen's speech, which uh, informs us that she's uh, come back as a ghost, um, encountering and hearing the voices of other ghosts. Do not despair, the house searching beneath the walls, no more than I have ghosts, I hear the voices. Uh, okay, now this um, very um, important image is further supplemented uh, and surrounded by another image of Helen, as a guest uh, upon the Trojan ramparts. And this image is um, accompanied by Helen's dirge. Therefore, we read and uh, listen to Helen's voice. Alas, my brothers, Helen did not walk upon the ramparts. She whom your curse was but the phantom in the shadow thing of a reflection. Now, again, as you can actually see, we're uh, here we have an image, um, the ghost like image of Helen, which is the visual result of uh, what Pound called, uh, which is not, sorry, the visual re result of what Pound called an equation in speech, but the image is equating with what Eliot um, called splotches of color uh, deriving from Helen's phantom, the shadow throne of a reflection, that is the dark shade reflected by her idolin. Therefore, what we see is actually um, the elusiveness of her presence as such dimming from the eye, um, sorry, steaming from the eye of the beholder. Now, this um, image is actually um, um, reverberated in words by Helen's speech, saying that she, she'd never been uh, in Troy, I mean, through her ditch. Yeah, you can actually see, I mean, it would be looking something like that. Okay, now this uh, image is further supplemented uh, and uh, again surrounded by a scene of a Trojan War, starting in Medea with an image of Achilles, whose voice we hear uh, upon the Trojan Rampers, sorry, outside the Trojan Rampers, whose voice we hear. So Achilles tells us the winters were ruthless and bleak, the summer but up with the and the army with fever. 
Hy kan dit de volle verfiet vir wat jy raak dit jy weet, hy stip toe vast en ek riep en hoeso sit die enkel hoe in sy tuin het gereis met my. Um, ok, again as you can see, uh, we're dealing with a little chair uh, or better iconography that appears as if it were on um, in visual terms, I mean a specimen of visual art. The um, the use of the noun Turet, uh, actually think that Turet derives from the semantic field, the fortress, whose actual similitude of form uh, it metonymically invokes, and, and also we call it pictorially, because, uh, due to the powerful effect of the gestalt, according uh, <coughs> to which you can actually visualize one thing as a whole. And uh, also, but what uh, Batshovsky Nikwis calls the image schematic property, property, property sort of metonymy. Also, the use of, uh, of verbs stooped and fastened actually sketch the, uh, the movements of Achilles' body, whereas the nines, um, Kriv and Uncle, um, actually uh, see a picture, if you want, the parts of, of a human body and armor that respond to such movements. Similarly, the verbs you stand in mind give us a sense of a dim fleeting image that turns and uh, looks Achilles in the eyes. Now, uh, this is also uh, accompanied by Achilles' speech, uh, which, um, let's say, reiterates in words what has already been depicted. You see, I could not see, but God had given to me the eyes of an eagle. She could leave by a secret gate in the animals be safe. Uh, so what the image portrays and what his speech actually uh, um, interprets in speech is uh, Patriarchy's accusations again against Helen of Sparta. Um, now, all those images, I mean, uh, Helen and Achilles inside and outside the, uh, the Trojan Gate, are actually uh, supplemented with um, another, uh, actually, more explicit Victoria fragments from uh, a Homeric iconography in the Iliad. He had shown with griefs, being part of his first unforgettable anger. So with the whirlwind of the chariot wheels, the clang of metal and the glint of steel, Achilles Lord did see more play. Now, once more, uh, words are used as signs. She held with griefs, actually signs that invoke the, uh, the image of, uh, of the warrior, which is, uh, I think most importantly, the image of uh, the Homeric warrior Achilles because he's the one most visible in the Iliad by his armor and, uh, and his shield. Also, the verb lorded creates the shape and expression of the face of a domineering Achilles, alluding to his uh, skill in battle and what woman calls his ungovernable temper. And uh, also the uh, sequence of nines <coughs> and phrases such as chariot wills and whirlwind and small play actually create an image of a tall column uh, of air within which Achilles' chariot moves fast across the sea more plain. Once more, uh, the rest of us actually reiterates it was what has already been depicted, that's Achilles' go, uh, ungovernable te um, temper, actually his anger, uh, and reiterates in words part of again, the Trojan War where he decides to enter the battle against the Trojans. Now, through the multiple layers of the palimpsest, Achilles it's also uh, depicted as Typhoon, uh, a well-known uh, monster from classical antiquity, which was a destroyer, as well as an uh, Osiris, uh, the Egyptian god, who was actually uh, put in a wooden chest and uh, killed by his brother Seth. So this portrayal uh, of Achilles as both a destroyer and a destroyer is also narrated uh, via Helen's speech, uh, who presents him as a destroyer and destroyed, whose very self was lost and who was defeated. Uh, my, uh, somebody might say, okay, but this is a poem and not a specimen of visual art, uh, to, uh, which is actually combined with text, and, and that's true. So why? Well, the form of writing H.D. Uh, uses here resembles some kind of what Megan Simpson calls picture writing. So, this kind of picture writing 
um, involves others. Uh, again, when Megan Simpson calls hieroglyph like images, such as the uh, the uh, that you read, uh, we might have seen, we might um, so which we saw later uh, upon the Trojan ramparts. Uh, but it's also combined with um, with images of, of human figures and. Uh, what I think is that those that actually appear to be those hieroglyphs, like images, are the hieroglyphs that we see uh, on the temple uh, walls. Uh, I mean, of Amun, of Karnak, and these are the ones Helen sees and attempts to uh, interpret. So, as some kind of hieroglyphs, they deliver some meaning. And what is this meaning? The meaning is that even Achilles, um, the well-known warrior, is the one who can actually escape death. Even the Greece incarnate hero god, as Simpson calls him, cannot escape uh, death. So, once more, those uh, hieroglyphs actually deliver uh, the absurdity uh, and uh, the absurdity of all its horrors, which are actually presented by the Macomber visuality of its, uh, of its landscape. Then, what we're dealing with uh, here is a uh, visual fragment of and what's interesting is that HD's use of the palimpsest um, makes us actually visualize and read this kind of poem by multiplicity of uh, viewpoints. And this also enables the poet herself capture some timeless reality that lies be between, uh, sorry, behind the, the changing visible world. The Volcanic's comment on Kibizo. And once more, what's this timeless reality? The false ideology of war and even most importantly, um, the way women have been silenced in history and have been mistreated by patriarchy. Uh, now, most surprisingly, even more surprisingly, um, later on we realized that uh, the temple where we actually see Helen uh, is actually a temple that uh, has a marble floor. As Helen tells us, the temple, the temple walls, it was nothing. The manuscript of thoughts to be to remember that breaks through the legend, the fame of Achilles, the beauty of Helen through the broken pictures on a marble floor. So again, this ancient temple um, becomes something more than what, what, what we actually think it is. But before we touch on that, I'd like to say that also Helen reminds us that all the things that we've seen as hieroglyphs on the Amun Temple are nothing but her own memories of her own past. And all those memories, as well as her visions uh, from her encounters with her uh, Achilles ghost, are actually projected on the temple walls. And these are the broken pictures, her memories. And probably uh, his voice, uh, she's also the one who ventriloquizes, has been ventriloquizing from the beginning. So as we also uh, <coughs> hear, uh, what those ghosts say, not far from Athens, yet Egypt, not far, not far from Ammon, your father, but dedicated to Isis, or if you will, Thetis. We uh, realize that uh, this temple here is actually a temple within a temple within another temple. Now, why is that? Well, if we, uh, if we take into account uh, the architecture of the temple, there are actually three, uh, the temple of Karna consists of three independent independent uh, temples, two, two of which are actually the Amun Temple and the other is of the ancient goddess Mount, who is uh, after the first century BC identified with Isis. Now those uh, temples are associated with, with avenues of sphinxes, so in this way we actually think of um, there's of one temple, one within a, uh, a temple within another temple. Now the fact that this temple also bears um, a marble floor actually helps uh, us realize that this is a temple within an, uh, another temple with another temple and that is the temple of Isis that's why the, the that is sorry that is why we actually see a temple that's dedicated not only to Amen but also to Isis and Thetis now why uh, should I mean what's the function <coughs> of this palimpsestic temple the function of this palimpsestic temple is to make clear first that Helen is both in Egypt and in Greece and there, she narrates her own story and the story of the Trojan War in free verse, and that makes her actually appear as the point of Helen in Egypt. Yet, behind her, there is HD, who actually uses um, the artistic pra uh, practices both of poetry and painting, so as to 
uh, depict an archaeological site. And there, she actually witnesses Helen uh, weaving her own story and the story of Trojan Y, the tapestry, as Helen does in Homer, according to Ingrid Holmberg. So there, Helen, uh, sorry, HD enables this, I mean, experiences this through Helen's uh, eyes and uh, also experience Helen's memories and visions while hearing Helen's voice communicating to her the memories of what Horace Gregory calls an ancient past in action. So I think what is amazing here is that um, HD actually recovers Helen's past via uh, making uh, timeless, uh, what Horace Gregory calls timeless references to her own times without, however, drawing any parallels. And at the same time, she identifies, and we also do uh, identify uh, fragments of her own present in uh, Helen's uh, narrative of her own uh, past. I mean, here, the, pr the present and the past seem to converge. And how is this effect created? Actually, because of the, um, of the use of the palimpsest, which according to uh, Alicia Ostrick, flattens time. So that the past is not a banal, but I would also say that it's also then, it's also uh, to, uh, now, that it's not only now, but also then. So we have this kind of interaction between present and past. 